uh, Acts chapter 5. We're in verse 17 to 42. And we've been looking at the uh, ongoing conflict between the apostles and their preaching the gospel uh, there in the temple and in Jerusalem uh, in the Sanhedrin uh, that, uh, again, this uh, ruling council we're going to see get together in this text made up of 70 members, Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, and uh, we made a distinction to say that primarily the persecution of the book of Acts comes from the Sadducees uh, because, after all, they don't believe uh, in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in miracles and so forth. They're kind of the humanists or the liberals of their, of their day, uh, but they are in power and they are ruling. Uh, and of course, uh, having people run around Jerusalem preaching a message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ doesn't sit well with them. Uh, and we have a growing church that is already uh, numbering more than 5,000 men and now women also are hearing the gospel coming to faith uh, in Christ. It's going to lead to some, uh, as we'll see, some real physical persecution here in this text. Uh, it was the English uh, uh, martyr himself, Hugh Latimer, that said, whenever you see persecution, uh, there's more than a probability that the truth is on the persecuted side. And uh, that's what we're going to see with the disciples this uh, morning. Let's look at the uh, fact that they were going to be divinely delivered as we find uh, and begin uh, this particular uh, passage with them uh, in jail. Verse 17 then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But a night an angel of the Lord opened the prison door and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught with the high priest and those with him called the council together and all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officials came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we have found the prison shut securely, and the guards standing outside before the doors, but we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what would the outcome be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. So the apostles are, are arrested here again for three reasons. One, simply because uh, Peter and John refused to obey. That was the instructions that uh, they basically bring them before uh, a group of this council, not the full Sanhedrin, but... Uh, Annas and, uh, of course, his five sons, his son-in-law, Caiaphas, uh, and basically order them to not preach any longer in the name of Jesus and so forth. Uh, they disobey that. They continue to preach in the temple. Uh, it's also because of the fact that, as I said, uh, the Sadducees <coughs> don't believe in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in angels and miracles and the resurrection, uh, uh, a life after this or eternal life at all. That's why we say they are Sadducee, unlike the, uh, the Pharisees. Uh, and so it came directly against the, you know, this uh, main thrust of their own theology. Uh, and three, as we see in the text, uh, they were just filled with envy and jealousy. Nobody was surrounding them to hear what they had to say. Everybody was surrounding the apostles to hear what they had to say. And certainly uh, the contrast could be more striking between uh, those that are powerful uh, in position but had no power in their ministry. And as they said, the uneducated, untrained men that had been with Jesus uh, in what God was doing in and through uh, their lives, including uh, the casting out of demons, uh, the healings and so forth that were so widespread. You remember that people were coming from all around the area hoping that uh, uh, Peter just passing by them would be enough to bring healing uh, to, to their loved one. Uh, so quite the contrast between these two groups of men. Uh, the apostles, we first say, were divinely delivered by this uh, angel. And uh, uh, whether the, uh, the guards were lulled into sleep, whether he made them invisible, we don't know how. Uh, but uh, the angel got them out of prison. Uh, we'll see the same thing occur with Peter later when he's in prison uh, once again. And it won't be the only occasion that we see angels involved in the lives of believers in the book of Acts. The writer of Hebrews says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? That includes you and I as well. And uh, sometimes it's 
great fun around the campfire, tell angel stories. Because uh, you probably have them, or if you thought about it, those times when it's like, man, I don't know how we got out of that one. You know, because of an intervention or it seems supernatural or, uh, or whatever. Uh, they, are, they are with us, they're around us. Uh, our prayers aren't to them, it's to Jesus. Uh, he, he, he directs and knows what he's doing, but they are sent as ministering spirits to actually serve us, uh, is what uh, the writer of Hebrews says. Uh, we'll see this continue throughout, uh, throughout the book of Acts. Uh, again, interesting uh, to note the means by which they were delivered uh, was by angels, given the fact that the Sadducees did not believe in their existence. So uh, I don't know if the, if the uh, story of their deliverance ever gets uh, told to them to the not, but they wouldn't be thrilled about that aspect as well. Uh, but what we are seeing and what the disciples are seeing certainly is that God is sovereign. Uh, they're in prison. Uh, the people in power says, you can't do this. And God says, do it anyway. And they do it. And when they do, they're in prison, but God releases them. Is that going to happen every time? No, it's not. Uh, but at least at this juncture, they know that if God wants them delivered, if God wants them out of the prison, if God wants them out of the du uh, dungeon, if he wants them out of the torture chamber, he can do it. There will be times when he doesn't, but they'll know that he has the power and he's sovereign and he can do it. If he leaves them there, then they're going to know it's for a reason, uh, it's for a purpose. And of course, they would all face much worse, well, than the beating they're going to see. We're going to see them take uh, in this passage uh, in just a moment. Matthew would later die by the sword, uh, martyred. Mark would die in Alexandria after being dragged through the streets. Luke was hanged on a large olive tree in Greece. John was boiled in oil and then released to leave, live his final days on the Isle of Patmos. James, the brother of John, was beheaded. Peter crucified upside down outside of Rome. Philip was hanged. Bartholomew was scourged and beaten till he died. Andrew was bound to a cross and preached to the top of his voice to his persecutors until he perished. Thomas was stoned outside of Madras, India. Jude was killed by executioner arrows. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas suffered the same fate at Salonika, and Paul was beheaded outside of Rome. It's all going to happen. They're all going to die for their faith. Uh, except John, again, God spares him to deliver the book of Revelation uh, and uh, seems to be able to die uh, of a natural causes there in Ephesus uh, and carries on a bit of a ministry there even in his uh, older years. Uh, everybody else dies a martyr's death. Uh, Jesus says you can't serve two masters, uh, and they knew that very well. Uh, and they obeyed God, and they, uh, no matter what, and they're going to continue to do that. Uh, they also... Uh, in the midst of this deliverance, received uh, a divine commission uh, where it's, uh, the angel says, go stand in the temple courts, tell the people the full message of this new life. And the, uh, the language here in the Greek suggests that uh, to do it, uh, to hold your ground, to be, uh, stand firm uh, and make sure you deliver the entire message of Jesus Christ. Uh, some uh, translations even capitalize the word life there just to uh, make the point. It is the life that we have in Jesus Christ. John, having heard that angel, having later written his gospel, and then this epistle uh, makes reference to that, I believe, in opening his letter, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. It was Irenaeus that said the glory of God is a man that's fully alive. And, uh, and these guys are fully alive uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's uh, amazing what uh, God is uh, going to uh, do through through their lives persecution it continues we talk all the time about in the last century there were more martyrs for uh, their faith in Jesus Christ than all centuries uh, combined it's not getting uh, getting better it's uh, it's getting getting worse uh, but everyone that uh, goes through this experience uh, has the same power of the Holy Spirit the grace of God to enable them to do uh, what they need to do to deliver the message of the gospel no matter what the circumstances uh, find themselves in. 
Uh, one such was a young woman living in uh, Leningrad who comes to faith in 1961. Her name is Ida Shrimpinakova. And uh, she, uh, at that time, uh, living under communist rule, wanted to share her faith in Jesus Christ. So she went on down to the Christian bookstore. <laughs> no, they didn't have one. <laughs> get some track. No, she went and bought some postcards of a beautiful sunrise over a harbor, and then she just wrote a poem uh, on the back of those cards that said, our years fly past, one after another unnoticed. Grief and sadness disappear. They are carried away by life. This world, the earth, is so transient. Everything in it comes to an end. Don't be happy-go-lucky. What answer will you give your creator? What awaits you, my friend, beyond the grave? Answer this question while light remains. Perhaps tomorrow before God, you will appear to give an answer for everything. Think deeply about this, for you are not on this earth forever. Perhaps tomorrow you will break forever your links with this world. Seek God while he is to be found. And to go over too well with the communist officials, and she was uh, arrested, exiled from Leningrad, lost her job or her home and so forth. Uh, she continues her work as an evangelist, handing out simple homemade tracts. She's arrested again in 1965. This time she's sent to a labor camp for a year. In 1968, she's doing the same thing. She's arrested again, this time a labor camp for three years, and it goes on and on and on. Why? Because she knew the life that the apostles were talking about here. Uh, and she felt compelled to tell others uh, about that life. If Jesus Christ really is the only hope, and if people are really going to perish for all eternity without them, uh, then we have a very compelling message to share with others. We must obey God. They were delivered uh, in a divine way by angels, uh, and then they were able to declare their loyalty before this council. That's in verse 27. And when they had brought, uh, had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Uh, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to the right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So the high priest declaring his concern of the message, notice they, again, it's the uh, it's all 70 members uh, of the Sanhedrin. So it's Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, just to, uh, uh, to make note who probably was in the room and hearing and witnessing all of this is a young Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus. Uh, you can, I think, make a pretty good case because of the authority that he derives from the high priest to go to Damascus with letters because he's giving, basically, we'll see in, uh, in chapter 7, uh, his approval gathering the coats and so forth for the stoning uh, of Stephen. He seems to be in a position of, of authority uh, and, uh, and therefore would be there during this time period. But even if he's not a member of the Sanhedrin, he's there because his rabbi, Gamaliel, we're going to hear from him in a moment, he's there. Gamaliel is his teacher, his rabbi, and if you were a disciple, you went everywhere they went. You heard everything that they said. And when there was this kind of meeting, which didn't occur every day, uh, certainly a young man named Saul of Tarsus would have been there. Uh, he's listening, he's watching, uh, he's hearing. Uh, it's going to take a few more, it's going to take a martyr's death, I think, to really get through to him, uh, and we're going to see that. And certainly uh, Stephen gives a powerful message uh, before uh, that council in, uh, in Acts chapter 7 here. We'll look at it in a few weeks. But it's the whole council uh, that's gathered together. Notice what they say in verse 8. You fill Jerusalem with your doctrine. And uh, of course that doesn't thrill the Sadducees because that doctrine accord includes the resurrection. Uh, and he says, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Keep in mind this is the same council that met uh, that uh, made the determination to crucify Jesus and hand him over to Pontius Pilate and, point, and push their point with him to make sure that he was condemned to die on a Roman cross. Uh, and even they at that time said, uh, hey, and let his blood uh, be on us and our children. Uh, but now we, we've got a problem because now we have Jesus' appearance uh, for over 40 days at one time before a crowd of over 500 people post-resurrection. We've got thousands now of men and women who've come to faith and believe in his resurrection and that they will have one too. Uh, and, uh, and word about his trials, which were illegal, 
and all the illegal activity done by the Sanhedrin around Jesus Christ are perhaps coming to light in Jerusalem during this time. And they're not real thrilled with it. Uh, but what a, what, a, what a great indictment to say that uh, uh, your, uh, your message has uh, filled uh, Jerusalem. You intend to bring this man's uh, blood on us. Well, that's exactly what they had asked for. And certainly they received that just penalty in that particular generation uh, in 70 AD. Secondly, uh, the declaration here includes Jesus to be prince and savior in verse 31. Him, uh, Peter speaking, him God exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior. Peter has already called Jesus the author of life. Uh, here the word prince means uh, pioneer, the one that you know basically goes where no man has gone before. And where no man has gone before is death. Jesus went into death and conquered death and, uh, and rose again. He came out to the other side. The writer of Hebrew uses this, uh, this same phrase uh, in a couple of other passages. In Hebrews 2.10, uh, I believe it's Paul writing here, says, For it was fitting for him, Jesus, for whom all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain, that's our word, of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus is our pioneer. Uh, he is the prince. Uh, he is the captain of our faith. Uh, is the idea and the use of all three of those words. Later in chapter 12 and verse uh, 2, uh, Paul writes, says, looking unto Jesus, the author, that's the same word there as well, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand uh, of the throne of God. Uh, and uh, used many other times in the New Testament in a similar way. Uh, Jesus, the author, the pioneer, he's gone before us and he's conquered death. Are you afraid to go there? I've never been there before. That's okay. Jesus has gone there. He's conquered death uh, before us. A number of uh, years ago, I heard about this, this trip uh, by, uh, by kayak uh, down the north coast of Molokai. I'd seen some pictures of it. I saw like a little five-minute clip on a news one night about it. I thought, Man, that looks cool. It's pristine coastline, highest sea cliffs in the world, so not accessible by, uh, by uh, any other way. Uh, and guys would go down it, I guess, occasionally on, uh, in kayaks. Eight, 18 miles, uh, four days. Uh, all the landings are on rocks, except for one that's uh, uh, the beach there, Pelicuna. Uh, just look, uh, looked awesome. Uh, so I got my kayak. I flew over there. I just headed out on my own. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. It's like, are you kidding me? It's a pretty dark blue water out there, and there is nobody around. And... Uh, I wouldn't do that. I needed a pioneer. <laughs> I needed somebody that had done it before. Uh, somebody that knew how to do it, and I was really sure they knew what they were doing. And, uh, and I found that person, and I met him, and they had done the, this guy had done the trip like three times. So I said, hey, if you ever do that again, let me know. I'd love to go with you. Because I wanted a pioneer. I wanted somebody that had already done it. So I, he called me later and said, hey, we're going to do it. We're going to go at the end of the summer. I get this kind of kayak, get this kind of dry bags, buy this kind of food. And then we started paddling together. And, uh, and so he did uh, all the prep with me. And uh, I mentioned it to uh, uh, Uncle Doug. And so he was uh, up for it. And, and so we did that first trip to Molokai with, uh, with a couple of other guys that had done it uh, many times. And it was an awesome experience. I would have never done that on, on, on my own. But I had somebody that had gone before me and said, no, you can do it. This is how you do it. Uh, Jesus has done that for us. He's in conquering death. You don't have to fear death. I've gone there. I've done that. Uh, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, he is the prince and our savior. He is the author of life. Uh, it means all of those things. The word savior is not a new word for the council either. It's used of physicians who save lives. It was used of philosophers who solve people's problems and dilemmas. It was used of statesmen who saved people from danger in war. And Jesus is the true savior of the world because he rescues us from sin and death. Quite a message the big fisherman is giving before the Sanhedrin here. Uh, and then he uh, declares their own loyalty to God. Uh, we must obey God rather than men. So under pressure uh, to change their mind and message, they refuse to do both. And notice he throws in, uh, it's not just us, it's the Holy Spirit, verse 32. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those uh, who obey him. Again, Christ exalted to the right hand of God, as was said would be the case in Psalm 110, verse 1. A place of power, honor, authority, 
equality. Uh, and we're going to see this, uh, as I mentioned, in Stephen's uh, wonderful testimony as he gives. And when he is being stoned to death uh, by a similar group of people, uh, and he's asking God to forgive them, uh, even as Jesus asked uh, his uh, captors to forgive him from the cross, uh, heaven opens up. And uh, Stephen uh, says his face looked as that of an angel, and he looked, and behold, uh, Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. No longer sitting, but now standing to receive uh, the first martyr of the church. Ken Hughes says the witness, witnessing power of the Holy Spirit is released through obedience to Christ, to his word, uh, to the inner voice of his guidance. We said a couple of things about the early church that we wanted to try to emulate. Uh, one was the fact that they were a church that were consistent in prayer, consistent in prayer. Uh, and we see it all the time, uh, not occasionally, uh, every day. They took it as a, a very serious task if they were going to uh, lead men and women and children to faith in Christ. They're not, you know, things are a little tough for us, and they're, and they're getting tougher. And this makes this a, a very important uh, message for us. Because there's a lot of people that are saying, stop mentioning Jesus in this workplace. You stop telling people Jesus about and about the gospel if you're going to be here. You know, we uh, it was kind of fun to see uh, see Stratton. Anybody see Stratton Doreen on, on the on the news this week? That was a crack up. So Stratton Stratton Doreen, I think they might be. They're coming back from the Big Island this week. Stratton, uh, you know, my uh, brother-in-law, uh, and uh, they were living on. They've been living on Maui for the last uh, three or four years. Uh, Strat had an idea, he's done it a couple of times. He's always looking for a way to do a little more evangelism. Uh, and with the, uh, the Maui County Fair, which is kind of uh, equivalent to the state fair uh, here on, on Oahu, uh, he decided, man, there'll be thousands of people come to this. I'll design a little track, you know, put something about, uh, you know, a picture of something, you know, the Eel Needle or something. You're very, uh, uh, people can look up and go, oh, that's Maui. And uh, he'll say something about uh, something better than Maui, something more beautiful. He'll tie it into the event. And of course, you open it up and it's a gospel track. So he, uh, he had about five or 6,000 of these things printed. Uh, and, uh, and then him and Jureen, his wife, uh, and, uh, they stood uh, basically on the sidewalk where, in between where people parked and when they went to the fair. And then they, uh, they stood there and uh, uh, they, they, went, they didn't say, uh, would you like a gospel track? Jesus died for your sins. And, you know, no, they just said, welcome to the Maui Fair. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. They passed out thousands of tracks. I want to say about the two of them, about 5,000 tracks in, in about two and a half days or whatever. Took a few hours, uh, but, uh, uh, but they were able to do it until a policeman or a couple of policemen came uh, and said, uh, you can't do that. You've got to stop. You know, uh, and they go, and just like, well, I'm standing on a public sidewalk here. And I'm pretty sure my First Amendment rights say uh, I've got freedom of speech and it's okay. But you know what? We're being very courteous to everyone. And if we notice that, uh, that uh, you know, there's a lot of people coming, we'll step aside because we don't want to impede anyone going into the fair at all. And I assure you, we're, we're being uh, very, uh, very nice to everybody that comes by. It's just whoever would like to take one of these. <coughs> Police officers said, and then laughed, and then and I guess they talked to whoever was at the fair, and they came back and said, "Now you got to go." Uh, well, where can we? Uh, they, they, they said they've got a permit for the fairgrounds for the parking lot and all the sidewalks. I don't know you can get a permit for a sidewalk, but they got it for the sidewalk. Or where can we stand? You'll see down there about a block and a half. You can stand on that corner down there. So they move on down. Uh, but of course, this is illegal. What the uh, police were doing. Uh, they uh, so they called they called the uh, I think they called the. Uh, ACLJ, you know, the uh, uh, J. Sutherland's organization, either they were busy or didn't want to take the, the, uh, the case, so they called the ACLU. And uh, because it wasn't a, well, my opinion, because it wasn't a freedom of religion issue and it was a freedom of speech issue, they took the case and they filed suit against Maui. So anyway, that's why uh, they were on, uh, on the news. Uh, and, uh, and so they're, they're on the news, and there's a picture of Strat's book and a uh, picture of the gospel track uh, that, that he's got there. And uh, uh, we're hoping that even a, a few more people might go to Amazon and find the book and, uh, and so forth. But there's a lot of voices that saying, you can't do that here. Uh, actually, we can. Our constitutional rights guarantee us this exact uh, ability. But it's all changing. Uh, it's changing in our country. It's changing here in the islands. To hand out a track, you need an attorney these days and you hope he's a pretty uh, pretty good one uh it's uh, it's a different day uh but uh the idea is that 
These guys were consistent in prayer. Uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But again, back to the Ken Hughes quote, <coughs> in, which ties in with verse 32. But that power of the Spirit is released through obedience. I can pray and ask God to fill me with his Holy Spirit. But that power is released when I actually obey God and begin to do the things he's told me to do. Again, the witnessing power of the Holy Spirit is released through obedience to Christ, to his word, to the inner voice of his guidance. So again, in my couple of questions, am I living consistently in the view of what I know about Jesus? Am I living a life that's in accordance with what I learn in the scriptures? Am I refusing to do what I know he's directing me to do? And am I refusing to share my faith because of fear of rejection or maybe even consequences? <laughs> One writer entitled this, uh, this uh, little section here, uh, Truth and Consequences, because uh, truth will bring consequences to us one way or another. We're all being a witness for Jesus Christ, either good or bad, but we're all being a witness one way, one way or another. We need to be like them in prayer, filled with the Holy Spirit, but we need to be obedient, obeying God. They're delivered uh, by God, divinely by an angel. They declared their loyalty. Uh, and again, the words of Jesus probably rang in their ears at this point from Mark 8, 35. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what profits it a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And I assure you, he's coming, and it seems like he's coming pretty quick. And uh, so we want to be like the Apostle Paul who said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because there's a temptation, isn't there? There's a temptation to say, not right now, not this place, not this person. When you, when you feel that, <laughs> that nudging of the Holy Spirit, say, no, this is the person, this is the time. Uh, it's not rocket science when you see somebody that's uh, uh, distraught and weeping to say, hey, can I help you? Are you okay? <laughs> you know, uh, we, we don't need a, you know, handwriting. It doesn't have to be a jet that flies across the sky and leaves a trail. Witness to that person. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> sometimes it's just pretty straightforward. You know, uh, there's people out there that uh, need hope in their lives. Uh, and it is not there apart from Jesus Christ. Uh, they're defended now by a Pharisee. A little interesting twist uh, in this uh, council at the Sanhedrin, verse 33. Uh, when they heard this, uh, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody. That means he claimed to be the Messiah. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let, the, let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But, it, but if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So a couple different reactions here from, uh, from uh, Gamaliel. And, uh, and of course, uh, 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 we're saying that he's... Uh, uh, he's no ordinary uh, Pharisee. Uh, just a couple of things about him. Gamaliel is still famous in Judaism even today. Uh, there's only seven rabbis that have ever been given the title Rabbat, and he is, uh, he is one of them. Uh, his grandfather was a man named Rabbi Halal, still very famous within Judaism today. Uh, and their dynasty of teachers uh, lasted for four centuries, son to son to son to son. Very noted. Uh, we also uh, uh, remember the fact that uh, uh, a young man named Saul of Tarsus studied at the feet of uh, Gamaliel. In the Mishnah, it was recorded because Gamaliel lived such a, a, a strict life. And, and Paul will make reference to it here in a moment uh, in uh, Acts 22. Such a strict life uh, according to the Mosaic law that he was admired uh, by many. 
uh, in the Mishnah records that when Ravan, Gamaliel the elder, died, there has been no more reverence for the law. And purity and abstinence died out at the same time. Uh, so again, it's uh, maybe hyperbole, but the idea of he was that well respected. So notice when he gets up to speak, he, he says, I command you to take these guys outside. And, th and nobody, nobody in that council is going, who that? No, they, they're like, yes, sir. And uh, uh, some, uh, some traditions say he was actually the president of the Sanhedrin at this time. There was a president and a vice president. Uh, it would be most likely be the high priest, but some tradition says it was Gamaliel. So uh, he's somebody when, when he's speaking here, very uh, highly esteemed uh, by, uh, by the people. Now, this is what Paul says uh, about him in Acts 22, verses 1 to 5, where he mentions him uh, in regards to his own uh, background in Judaism. There he says, uh, uh, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, uh, they kept all the more uh, silent. This is on the, on the Temple Mount, and they're about ready to rip Paul to death. Uh, then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. So again, Paul says, I was born there, but I was raised in Jerusalem right here. Taught according to the strictness of our father's law, as zealous towards God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. Did you catch that? I persecuted the way. That's The way is the sect of, of, uh, of Judaism that all these Christians belong to right now. There are no Gentiles that are saved yet, and for these first uh, several years, it's Christianity as we know it today is another sect of Judaism referred to as the way. Uh, notice he says he's persecuted the way to what? To death. Did Paul have a hand in actually torturing and persecuting Christians until they died? That's what he says, right? Right, right here. He was a bad guy. Uh, and uh, it wasn't just men. Both men and women, he says, verse 5. As also the high priest bears uh, uh, me witness in the council of, of the elders, for whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there, to Jerusalem to be, to be punished. So again, this is Saul of Tarsus. The later the Apostle Paul, you talk about a trans transformation. It's no wonder when he comes to faith in Christ and goes to Jerusalem, nobody wants to have anything to do with him. They're afraid of this guy. They're afraid he's just coming in to find out who the leaders are, and then he's going to have them all, all, all executed. They're afraid of him for a very long time. Uh, and his, uh, his transformation uh, just had to be astounding uh, to those in the first century that were familiar with him. Uh, as he says that in another case, I was rising well above my peers within Judaism. People knew who Saul of Tarsus was. But he studies at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel's advice is, uh, you know, just kind of neutrality. That's not Paul's advice. Paul's advice is I think we should kill every one of them. So he doesn't agree with his uh, rabbi mentor uh, in regards to this new sect of Judaism. Secondly, the apostle's defender, I would say, may not have been honest. He makes several mistakes in his logic that I want to point out. One is he classified Jesus with uh, two, two rebels. So he'd already, uh, he'd already uh, has a foregone uh, conclusion in terms of who Jesus was. He mentions Theodos, who claimed to be the Messiah. He leads a rebellion. He's killed by Romans. And he says Jesus is just like him. The second example is Judas of Galilee. This would have perked up a few more ears because Judas of Galilee is the founding member of the Zealots, the sect. Uh, that sect of Judaism, which basically were military uh, and militant in nature, uh, and they uh, felt that on behalf of God and the nation, they needed to take up weapons and do their very best to overthrow the Romans uh, in terms of a, a military nature. Uh, this happens, he says, during the census. This is in 6 AD. This is not the census from which Jesus was born, which is about 4 BC, uh, but it's a census from which uh, 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 the Galilee area was already a Roman province. That's why uh, Jesus, uh, when he's up there, had to pay, had to pay taxes to, to Rome and so forth. Judah wasn't like that until 6 AD. Uh, and then they, uh, they did a census of the people down there. They wanted to make uh, the southern part of Israel, Judah, uh, a Roman province. Uh, and people didn't like that idea. And uh, as you can understand, it, so there was a riot and a revolt against it. A lot of people died. It was led by Judas of Galilee. <laughs> and Gamaliel said, look, these two guys are prominent, but look what happened to them. Uh, and Jesus is just like them. So he classifies Jesus with two other rebels. 
Secondly, he assumed that history would repeat itself. Because it happened this way in the past, it would happen that way in the future. But uh, he's overlooking the fact that God broke into history when he brought the Messiah uh, to Israel uh, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead. That never happened before. Uh, God broke into history. History does not always repeat itself. Uh, and uh, in three, <clears throat> he thought that unless something was, uh, uh, was uh, if, if something was not of God, then it would fail. Uh, but uh, he overlooked two things, Satan and the sin nature of man. No, there's a lot of things that are not of God that don't just fade away. Uh, there's a thing called Islam. I say it's not of God and it's not fading away. You know, but uh, the Gamaliels would say, just let it go. You know, if it's not of God, it'll just, no, it won't just go away. A, a number of years ago, I would say about 30, I got to hear Dr. Walter Martin when he had come uh, in, into uh, Calvary Honolulu and spoke a couple of nights. And I remember the first time I, I got to hear him, pretty good 30 years ago, he, the title of his message was called The Gamaliel Complex. And he said, and he quoted this passage, and he says, Unfortunately, the church has listened and received the advice of Gamaliel, believing it's biblical advice. And he says, it's in the Bible, but it's not biblical. He says, and therefore, when the cults begin to rise in this country, like Mormonism, like Jehovah's Witness, and other ones, there were many church leaders that said, well, who are we to oppose it? Listen to the advice of Gamaliel. If it's not of God, well, it'll just die out. If it is of God, who are we to oppose it? He says, and both that reasoning was wrong. And we've got those cults with us today. And then he went on and basically gave an expose to show the difference we have doctrinally and, uh, and so forth uh, between those two groups and, uh, and many others that uh, Dr. Martin was, uh, what is an expert in. Uh, Mark Twain once said, a lie runs around the world while the truth is still putting his shoes on. You know, so uh, just the, the fact that something has some success or size or whatever uh, is uh, uh, nothing that indicates whether it's true uh, or not. So again, the, uh, the weakness of Gamaliel and his arguments and decision was one of neutrality. Uh, Jesus said, uh, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters uh, abroad. If he was serious uh, about his thinking about Jesus, why didn't he investigate the evidence uh, of his resurrection? Why didn't he search the scriptures to see what the prophets had to say about a Messiah that would come and, uh, and die and, uh, and rise again? Why didn't he listen to the eyewitnesses that had been there in Jerusalem and heard Jesus and saw him on many occasions post-resurrection? Why didn't he get down on his knees and ask wisdom from God? He did none of these things. Again, so we'd say his advice is in the Bible, but it's not biblical advice. It did save the lives of the disciples for a period of time, uh, but it didn't spare them physical persecution. Look at verse 40. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them. <laughs> if you're in Jerusalem and you get a chance to go on a tour, not all tours, but some will take you to the home of Caiaphas, to the place where this council was held uh, with these 70 members. You can go downstairs in what appears to be a, a basement, an area where animals were kept, uh, and there in that area you'll find the torture chamber that was there. You'll find the actual place where all of the apostles uh, were tied by their ankles uh, and by their wrists, and you'll see the openings carved in the rocks where they were stretched out. You'll see a, a large basin carved into the rocks where their blood would pool at the bottom, uh, and then they were beaten either with leather strips or with rods, it's not the can of nine tails that Jesus went through, uh, but still a lot of people died from it just from the loss of blood. And nobody walked out of there. They crawled out of there on their hands and knees. Uh, yeah, you understand, need to understand that as we read the, the next couple of verses about the apostles themselves. By the way, if you go on and read 1 Corinthians, you'll find that the apostle Paul had this happen to him on three occasions, as well as all the other things that uh, he went through for the gospel's sake. The fourth thing, lastly, uh, is that they were willing to suffer disgrace for the name. And that's in verse 41. So they departed uh, from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching uh, Jesus as, uh, as the Christ. The, uh, we'd say the disgrace didn't keep them from rejoicing, which is, uh, uh, you know, is amazing. You know, that for them, uh, they had to understand that Jesus predicted these things. 
Uh, blessed are you when, pers- when men persecute you and revile you for my name's sake. And that's exactly what was happening. They'd watch Jesus go through it. Now they were going through it. And they thought, praise the Lord, we've been counted worthy for this to happen to us. People still do this. People still do this uh, around the world. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. William Temple said that Christians are called to the hardest task of all. To fight without hatred. To resist without bitterness. And in the end, if God granted so, to triumph without vindictiveness. Uh, and they all thought it was a privilege to be beaten for the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, one of the uh, probably uh, uh, more prominent books uh, on this uh, on the subject is written by Richard uh, Wormbrand. I think I have a, a picture of the uh, cover up here. Uh, Tortured in Christ, been translated in over 60 languages. Um, Dr. Wormbrand eventually was able to escape uh, Romania. He and his wife had founded Voice of the Martyrs. That ministry still uh, exists today. Uh, but uh, during his incarceration, uh, this is again on, under Romania, uh, under the communist reign, uh, his, him being incarcerated for simply uh, preaching the gospel, being a pastor. Uh, he's arrested. Uh, he's, uh, he's beaten in a very <coughs> similar way that the apostles uh, were beaten in, uh, and then was placed in solitary confinement for, uh, for months at a time. He has one book entitled uh, Sermons from Solitary Confinement, because what he did every day uh, when it was just uh, himself he would get up in the morning and pray and spend time with the Lord. Uh, and then he would begin to uh, prepare a message. He would select a text from memory. He would uh, go over it in his mind. He would develop his three points, his cross-references, his illustrations. He would plan it all out. Uh, and then he would stand up that evening in his cell and preach that sermon at the top of his lungs. And he'd get up and do the same thing the next day. Uh, by the time he was re- released from prison, uh, it was said he looked like a scarecrow with his teeth rotting out. But he was passing by a woman who had uh, just come in from the fields, and she had a large uh, bowl or a basket of strawberries with her and, and offered him some. And his reply was, uh, no, thank you, because I'm going home to fast and pray with my wife with the hopes that I can have the same joy outside of prison that I've had in, in prison. Uh, Richard Warmbrand. Uh what these apostles go through or what people go through to, today, uh, it continues. Uh, and apparently it is possible to have a joy even in the midst of this kind of persecution. Uh, they were the disgrace <coughs> that did not keep them from being faithful witnesses. Notice verse 42. And daily in the temple, some translations say day after day. So they continue to go right back into the very temple, uh, right back to the place where they were arrested uh, uh, before. Uh, and then again, they were witnesses in the temple because uh, that was a place, that was a prime location to, uh, to uh, be there and share the gospel with people that knew the scriptures, that believed in God and so forth. They just hadn't seen that Jesus was their, their Messiah. We'll see Paul do the same thing on his uh, missionary journeys. His MO was major city, go to the synagogue, reason from the scriptures first, uh, and then whoever believed and whatever the rejection was, he would, uh, he would move on from there. Notice they were witnesses uh, in their homes at the end of verse 42, and in every house. Uh, again, at that time, there was no way they could meet like we do today, gathered together publicly, uh, so they met in homes. Uh, and then at the end of verse 42 also, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Messiah, as, uh, as the Christ. So preaching, that is the proclamation of the gospel, telling people about Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins. Uh, The teaching is, again, what we focus on here. It's how the church is equipped. It's how we're uh, built up uh, in our our faith. Uh, We kind of like to say that healthy sheep begat other sheep. And uh, so we do our best to to feed the sheep, even as Jesus told uh, the Apostle Paul. I I wanted to bring to your attention uh, a little video that I was able to get off the Calvary Chapel uh, website. Uh, Perfect uh, timing. The uh, Calvary Chapel Magazine, Missions Magazine, showed up yesterday. Uh, persevering through persecution. <laughs> Trying to figure out how, how would I end this message, and I, I found it right here. Uh, in, the, in this, and of course this is uh, Nagmed, she is the, uh, the wife of, uh, of uh, our Calvary Chapel pastor that's been uh, imprisoned in Iran since uh, 2012. And, um, uh, and in the article, and in the, uh, the magazines are back there, and uh, I encourage you to get one on their way out there. Free 93, and uh, uh, a lot of other uh, great articles in there as well. 
they, uh, they were both part of uh, Bob Codwell's church at Calvary Chapel, Boise. They're both Iranian, uh, and, uh, and you can read them more about their, uh, their stories here. But uh, there's a little clip that was online from uh, uh, the website. kids sang a song at Christmas, they said it's not about, you know, the Christmas tree, it's about the cross. We know why Jesus came. God sent him for one reason and one reason only, and that was the cross. But as Christians, I think what the Lord has showed me is that we forget that that is our calling as well. She was on her way to the United Nations uh, uh, to speak, and, uh, and the Lord uh, uh, used his imprisonment to give them a, a, a tremendous platform. And, he, and she said, and you'll read in the article, uh, that uh, you know, her and her husband, you know, were, uh, their ministry uh, in, uh, in Iran was so fruitful. I mean, there are thousands of Christians, if you don't know, in, in Iran today. Uh, and, uh, because of, uh, and it all happened because the Muslims were able to take over in 1979. And then people in that country found what it was really like to live under Sharia law and under uh, a Muslim uh, rule. And they went, not so good. And, uh, and a lot of people got very open to hear about Jesus Christ. Uh, and a lot of them have come to the Lord. She said, we came back to Idaho. Uh, we came to Idaho. And, uh, <laughs> you know, just the ministry just wasn't quite so fruitful. And we're just paying, praying all the time. Lord, help us to be able to still be able to reach Muslims uh, for faith in Christ. And, she says, and now he's doing it. Uh, she spoke in on uh, live on radio, broadcast to millions uh, of Muslims in the Middle East, being able to speak to them in Farsi, uh, and uh, being able to openly live share the gospel of Jesus Christ. She um, uh, was on her way last summer, and I'll make reference uh, here in the article to uh, uh, to speak at the uh, United Nations, and uh, she had concluded that. Uh, what she would do is what the Apostle Paul did, is that when he's given uh, basically a, a platform like that, as, uh, as we'll see as we get to Paul, he just he never defends himself before these kings. He just uses it to preach the gospel. Uh, and that's what she did in that uh, hearing as she gave testimony uh, before that United Nations group when her voice was being translated into 196 languages simultaneously. She shared the gospel of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, she says uh, here at the uh, end of the article, uh, we wouldn't trade this for anything, uh, Dogmic concluded. It's hard, painful, uncertain, and Saeed's the one really suffering for it. The pressure, torture, and abuse are all on him. Uh, but if that's the way the Lord is doing it, like Paul was in prison, then we are thankful for it. This has given us what we've always wanted, the intimate presence of the Lord. In letter, Saeed talks about... Uh, uh, forgiving his oppressors uh, and, and getting so much joy in prison. He has led more than 30 people to Christ in prison. However, she added, we need prayer. Saeed needs God's strength to stand in the darkness. Most of his relatives know the Lord, but they're new believers and they need strength. I've dealt with anxiety, depression, and despair. When you pray, you're holding up my hands. We're fighting the good fight together. Pretty powerful stuff. The book of Acts, we're living it. So that's not archaic. It's, it's really where we're at today. And uh, So here's the church, committed to prayer, committed to living in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is released as we obey God. Let's pray. The Lord is the strength of his people. Though war rise against me, my heart shall not fear. And I will dwell in his house, in his temple.
forever.